All right, this time we're going to be looking at uh, when animals evolved and how animal, animals evolved and the evidence that supports uh, why we think they evolved, when they evolved, and how they evolved, um, which has to do with embryonic development. And, and that's going to lead us into this concept in, uh, that is, a, is involved in how we classify animals, and that's according to what we call the body plan. Different phyla of animals have different body plans, and, and so we'll be looking at that also. So first, let's look at when animals may have evolved uh, and the evidence supporting that. Well, you know, fossil evidence is the best evidence supporting when certain organisms appeared on, on the planet. You know, it, it indicates it's indicated in the fossil record. When they appear in the fossil record is when they appeared on the planet, but that's not necessarily the case. For example, what we're looking at here are possible sponge fossils, fossils of sponges. And notice that they're only 1.2 millimeters across. Um, and this is a scanning electron micrograph, but they look very much like sponges. Um, but they're 600 million years old. Well, just because that's the oldest fossil animal that, or, that we found doesn't mean that animals weren't around before that. So it's speculated that animals ha uh, were around and did evolve even before 600 million years ago. So where is that in geologic time compared to other major events? Well, if we go all the way back in geologic time to the formation of the Earth, and if you'll recall, that's about 4.8 billion years ago or 4,800 million years ago and that's where we begin on our geologic time scale that we're looking at here. Very shortly after the formation of the earth when the earth was still hot um, we had molecular evolution and that went on for quite a while until eventually about 4 billion years ago so only about 800 million years after the earth forms um, do we see the appearance of the first prokaryotes, or at least we think we, uh, that's when the prokaryotes first appeared, about 4 billion years ago. And remember, those are basically bacteria. They're, they're simple cells without a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. At some point, about 3.5 billion years ago, uh, prokaryotes obtained the ability to photosynthesize. So, and photosynthesis has the product of oxygen. So at the same time, oxygen started being added to the oceans first and then the atmosphere. So oxygen's building up slowly over all this, this long period of time, about a billion years, first in the oceans, then in the atmosphere. And we see just following the buildup of oxygen, the uh, endosymbiosis of cells, of prokaryotic cells, in other words, prokaryotic cells coming together, forming symbiotic relationships with each other, and that gives rise to eukaryotes. In other words, cells that do have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. And that's about two billion years ago that that took place. And what we're talking about, basically, you know, if we were to classify those organisms today, they'd be single-celled uh, organisms with a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. And we would call them a protist. So basically, protists appear about two billion years ago through the process of endosymbiosis if you'll recall because we studied that in pretty great detail numerous times actually because it's so important now because what we're studying now are animals we're going to we're going to ignore the evolution of fungi and the evolution of plants which um, took place you know they are also eukaryotic and that their evolution did take place starting around that same time because we have the plant-like protists and the fungus-like protists, but we're interested in the animal-like protists. And sometime in here, we see the evolution of the animal-like protists evolving the, ability, uh, the evol evolving the characteristic of being multicellular. And that's the threshold of crossing over from the kingdom Protista to, to the kingdom Animalia. And it's speculated that that may have happened approximately one billion years ago. So about a thousand million years ago. Um, and that's what this arrow is for along our phylogenetic tree. Animals may have appeared uh, at that time. We see them in the fossil record, though, not until around this time. This is about 600 million years ago. So that would co coincide with this fossil uh, that we have here. So that was about, uh, that was in the Ediacarian period. Um, 
the e that's what this ed period stands for is ediacarian we find animal fossils soft-bodied animal fossils from that time just at the end of the um the uh, proterozoic eon at the very end of the proterozoic eon before going into the phanerozoic and back when we were studying geologic time uh, we spent most of our time in the phanerozoic era that's the more recent era or eon i should say that's the more recent eon and so there's a lot more fossil evidence and you can see that it's divided up into a lot more periods than the other eons are um, but the phanerozoic eon and the paleozoic era if you'll recall begins with the cambrian period so this very first period that's not labeled here um, at the very beginning of the paleozoic era and the phanerozoic eon is when animal life just exploded if you'll recall so that's about 570 million years ago uh, we see this explosion of animal life in the in the fossil record don't confuse that with the big bangs definitely not the same thing if you'll recall the big bang is the uh, or is the theory that tries to explain the origin of the universe which is like 15 billion years ago or at least 14 and a half billion years ago so we're not talking about that we're talking about the appearance of animal life in the fossil record uh, that seems to happen just about all at once but really what's going on is that they evolved shells and exoskeletons hard parts that fossilized really well and so they uh, it, it, it looks like they just appear all of a sudden in the fossil record when you know they were really around before the cambrian they just didn't have shells and exoskeletons so the idea is that animal evolution took place somewhere in this time. At, at some point during this period of time, beginning about one billion years ago, uh, unicellular protists became colonial, and then colonial protists became multicellular. Somewhere in here. And that's how we end up with multicellular, what we would consider a true animal, a multicellular animal. Now, sponges are thought to have been one of the first animals because, again, you know, like, this is the oldest animal fossil there is, and it's a sponge. So sponges are probably some of the first animals that evolved. And they're made up of cells that look very similar to the cells that make up this colonial protist known as a choanoflagellate, right? So these, this is a choanoflagellate, and there are different species of choanoflagellates, and, and some of them are actually... Um, balls of of these same kind of cells um, called choanocytes right so that's the name of the cells a single cell is a choanocyte it's also known as a collar cell because they have this membranous collar that surrounds their flagellum right and they use that collar to trap food they use the flagellum to move water and then there are particles of food in the water that get stuck you know, on the membrane of the collar and then they engulf that food by phagocytosis and eat it. Take the, the food particle inside and digest it using lysosomes, if you'll recall. Uh, so forming a food vacuole to, and then lysosomes fuse with the food vacuole and digest the food and, and that's how they get their nutri nutrients. They're, so they're filter feeders. Um, this species is also, also sessile. It's a sessile filter feeder and sessile means it attaches and stays in one place. Um, and that's the lifestyle of a sponge. So the idea here is that sponges having the same kind of cells and the same kind of lifestyle as this colonial protist um, suggests that sponges may have evolved or have common ancestry with a colonial protist like this choanoflagellate. The question is how may have that transition happened? How, how, well, you know, what were the selective pressures, as we say, that would drive a colonial protist like this to evolve into uh, the first animals, truly multicellular organisms. And that's what this slide is about. This slide is a possible scenario of the transition from colonial to multicellular. And in this case, we're looking at a, a species of choanoflagellate that is a solid, starts out as a solid ball of cells. So we start out with a solid ball colonial choanoflagellate um, species. So it's species one right sp1 here stands for species one and the arrows here represent geologic time long periods of geologic time so 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of years are passing as we go from species one to species two to species three and so on. So this is evolution. We're representing evolution here. And the evolution, the first step in evolution is from a solid ball of choanoflagellates to a hollow ball of choanoflagellates. And not only is it a hollow ball of choanoflagellates, it's also larger, notice, than this small ball, solid ball of choanoflagellates. So the, the, my question to you is, what's the selective pressure that would have driven that evolutionary advancement or that evolutionary step, that evolutionary change? In other words, what, what is being selected for here and why? So pause the video right now and, and think about it. What advantage is there to being a large hollow ball colony of cells rather than a small solid colony of cells? The important thing about being a large hollow ball colony um, is that there would be increased surface area. Increased surface area for two things. Being able to exchange things with the surrounding water, and I'm sorry, I forgot to point out that this would be in water, you know, because these choanoflagellates would be filter feeding, moving water, and, and filtering food from the water. So being a hollow ball of cells is going to increase the ability of the colony to get oxygen, for example, and to get rid of carbon dioxide. And also to get food, because the more surface area there is to the colony, the more choanoflagellate cells there are in the colony, the more food can be obtained by the colony, the more food can be filter fed, uh, filter feeded, <laughs> fed by the colony. And you may have come up with something different, but really it's the increase in surface area that would be my number one choice for the selective pressure for that evolutionary step. And then we see the evolutionary step from species two to species three here of, of specialized cells, specialized reproductive cells. Notice they don't have flagella, so they're not able to uh, filter feed themselves. Um, so they're specialized for reproducing. In other words, and, and let's say they're specialized for sexual reproduction. So what's the selective pressure there? Again, pause and think about it for a minute, and I think you'll come up with it. What's the, what's, what's the most important thing about sexual reproduction? That would be the selective pressure. I know you know what it is. It would be an increase in variation variation between individuals of this of this species of the population of this species so that's the next evolutionary advancement and then we see the evolutionary advancement of infolding infolding of one end at one end of the colony and notice that that infolding also includes the, those specialized reproductive cells so what would be the advantage of that that what selective pressure would there be to select for a species that is folded in at one end, or at least somewhat folded in at one end, including the reproductive cells. So again, pause and think about it. So what you come up with? Well, what I come up with is that it protects the reproductive cells. By folding in at this end of the colony, the, the reproductive cells are tucked into this little cavity, um, and within that cavity, the reproductive cells are protected, but also it allows for a cavity in which eggs, for example, could be fertilized. So if this is a female of the species, she might be uh, releasing eggs or producing eggs that would be hanging out in this cavity and then sperm would come swimming from a male of the species and fertilize the eggs within that cavity, within that uh, protected space. So that would be a possible uh, evolutionary advantage or selective pressure um, to cause that kind of evolutionary step. Then finally, as the scenario goes, because remember, this is just one possible scenario. Nobody knows for sure without a time machine how animals evolved. Um, but there is evidence supporting this, and we'll be looking at that, at that on the next slide. So the, this last step, this last evolutionary advancement, shows uh, the further infolding, um, creating more of an internal compartment within this species, species five here, and we also see that there's further specialization of cells. Notice that the original choanoflagellate cells have flagella around the outside of the animal. And we're, we are going to call this an animal at this point because it, it can be considered truly multicellular. And we'll get to the reason for that in a minute. Well, actually, the reason has to do with the fact that um, you can identify at least three different specialized cells here. 
So we've got these specialized cells around the outside that have flagella. We have the specialized reproductive cells, but then not notice that we now have these other cells that are lining the internal cavity that don't have flagella. And those are a, a third kind of specialized cell. They represent a third kind of specialized cell. And there may be more specialized cells than that. But um, So it's a combination of being more than one cell and also having multiple specialized cells that makes a multicellular organism considered to be multicellular. So in this uh, quote-unquote animal, primitive animal, which by the way looks very much like a sponge, we see two tissue layers. There's the layer of tissue on the outside, but then there's the layer of tissue that's lining the internal compartment. We see what could be considered a di digestive cavity on the inside, which is what we find inside a sponge as well, and, and other animals too. And we see at least three specialized cell types. And so this could be considered the first animal, the simplest first animal that may have evolved somewhere in this time period between 1 billion years ago and 570 or so million years ago before the Big Bang. Now, what evidence is there for this scenario? Well, let's check that out. That's on the next slide. The evidence for that scenario is how animal embryos develop. Embryonic development of, amb am uh, of animal embryos looks very similar to the scenario that we were looking at on the previous slide. And if you'll recall, because I've brought up this, this concept before, uh, it's known as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny which is a long-winded way of saying that embryonic development replays evolution. Now, the important thing to note here is that it's a completely unsupported idea. In other words, there's no evidence, there's no, there's no experimental evidence supporting the idea that embryonic development shows how evolution, early evolution of animals took place. But um, it's still an interesting idea. And without a time machine, we really are probably never going, going to know for sure how animals first evolve. So as I describe animal uh, embryonic development here, keep in mind the scenario we were looking at on the previous slide. So we start with a zygote, which is a fertilized egg, right? That's a zygote. And it undergoes cleavage. Well, in, in uh, embryologist language, those, those biologists that study embryology, um, they like to use the term cleavage to refer to cell division. So what, what cleavage refers to is mitosis and cytokinesis, right? That's, that's cell division. And so we go from a zygote to what's known as a marula, which is a solid ball of cells. Does that sound familiar from the previous slide? That's where we started, right? That's species one from the previous slide. So the marula here, the solid ball of cells, um, then continues to divide and becomes a hollow ball of cells again. Species two from the previous slide, a hollow ball of cells, and that's known as a blastula. So we go from a marula, from a zygote to a marula to a blastula, a hollow ball of cells, and then that hollow ball starts to infold at one end. We see infolding, and that's the process known as gastrulation. The process of infolding at one end of the embryo is known as gastrulation, and it forms what's known as a gastrula. So this is a gas. This is an early gastrula, and this is a late gastrula. Uh, we, we would refer to that as the gastrula stage of embryonic development. Um, and there's an opening here into an internal cavity, right? So the internal cavity is what's going to become in whatever animal this is. And by the way, all animals start out their development this this same way. Um, so th that's going to become the digestive cavity. Um, and this whole structure that results from the infolding is referred to as the archenteron. So the archenteron is the primitive gut. It's also referred to as the primitive gut. And there's an opening to that cavity. Uh, and that opening is, is first called the blastopore, right? Because it's, it's an opening that appears in the blastula through gastrulation. It appears in the blastula. Um, if, if I were naming it, I'd call it the gastropore because it's actually in an early gastrula. But anyway, they call it a blastopore. 
And that blastopore is either going to become a mouth or an anus, depending on what animal you're talking about. Different animals undergo different embryonic development, and that opening uh, becomes either a, it becomes a mouth in some animals and becomes an anus in other animals. And we'll be we'll be coming back to that idea later on, um, because that's actually a characteristic that we use to to uh, group animals together and, and uh, suggest that they're more closely related to each other. So note that the early gastrula and the late gastrula look very similar to species four and five on the previous slide. Um, and so that's the idea. Uh, embryonic development, animal embryonic development, may show us how animals first evolved. How animals first evolved from a colonial choanoflagellate to a, a truly multicellular uh, sponge. And you'll notice that I have part, the very beginning part of the phylogenetic tree of the animal kingdom here with the first two phyla, Periphera and Cnidaria and Tenophora, um, represented here. And that's because these species, sponges and jellyfish and, and anemones and corals and ten, tenophores or comb, comb jellies, all show this, this level of embryonic development. In other words, this is all the farther they go. So note that at this level of embryonic development, there's no mesoderm, and you're not going to understand what that means uh, at this point. But notice that I've labeled here ectoderm, which is ecto means outside and derm means skin. So ectoderm means outside skin, and it's referring to this tissue layer that surrounds the uh, cover or, or covers the animal. And then there's endoderm, which is represented by the lining of the archenteron. Right? So we have ectoderm, we have endoderm, so we have outside skin and inside skin, endo meaning inside. So those are two, those represent two tissue layers, right? Two, and we also refer to them as germ layers. So when you hear germ layer, think tissue layer. When you think, when you hear tissue layer, think germ layer. They're one and the same thing. Um, and they're also, it's also an acelomate which means it doesn't have a cavity inside the body other than the digestive cavity. And I know it looks like there is this space between the endoderm and the ectoderm, but actually the archenteron is going to continue to uh, take up that space and actually the two cell layers are going to come together and form a solid, form a solid tissue. So we're going to move on and take a look at um, the the difference between animals that form their mouth first and their anus first, because again, that's a characteristic that we use to classify them, and it has to do with what what's known as the body plan. Um, but before we leave, I just want to point out that you know the idea here is that this is embryonic development, and this is a possible scenario of animal evolution, and they look very similar to each other because we don't have a whole lot of evidence about how animals may have first evolved and, and embryonic development may be that evidence. Ontogeny may recapitulate uh, phylogeny, even though we don't have much uh, experimental evidence to support that idea. All right, hopefully you recognize this as a late gastrula from the previous slide. And notice that I've labeled ectoderm here, the outside skin, and endoderm, the inside skin, and notice that now we see a, a red layer in this diagram anyway that represents mesoderm, middle skin, right? In between the ectoderm and the endoderm. And also note where it's forming. It's forming right there at the juncture between the ectoderm and the endoderm. And that's an important point in differentiating what's known as protostome development from deuterostome development, which we'll, we'll be looking at on the next slide. All right, and notice that I've got a portion of the phylogenetic tree here that represents all the animal species or all the animal phyla that are protostomes. And protostome means first mouth. Proto means first and stome refers to mouth. So it literally translates to first mouth. And that's because the blastopore, that first opening in the embryo into the archenteron in the digestive cavity, uh, is going to become the mouth, not the anus, right? And that's the difference between protostome and deuterostome development. In protostomes, the blastopore becomes the mouth, 
and in deuterostomes, the blastopore becomes the anus. Notice too that as, as time passes, and this, that's what I'm trying to get across to you with this arrow here, is that the archenteron continues to infold until it comes in contact with the ectoderm at the other end, uh, at the other end of the, of the embryo, and it fuses with that, uh, with the ectoderm and produces another opening. So in protostomes, the mouth forms first and the anus forms at the other end of the embryo second. And so that's, that's what we see here. The anus is second. Mouth first, anus second. And this is what the embryo would look like. And, you know, both of these are sliced open so we can see what's going on on the inside. So that's something else that uh, you'll want to note here. You'll also notice that by the time we get to this level of development, um, what we've got is what's described as a tube within a tube. So the tube, one of the tubes is the alimentary canal that runs through the entire animal from mouth to anus, right? That's the, the digestive tract, the alimentary canal. That's a tube. And, it, uh, you know, it's a tube form, formed by the endoderm. But we've also got the tube of the whole body. The whole body is a tube. And so the tube of the alimentary canal is running within the tube that is the whole body. So that's why this body plan is referred to as a tube within a tube. Body plan. Um, we also see in this diagram that a second cavity has formed within the body. And that's known as a coelom. That's how you pronounce that, coelom. Um, and it's a, it's a body cavity that's completely within mesoderm. It's completely surrounded by mesoderm and it, and it appears within the, the mesoderm, um, tissue. And, and so that's called a coelom. So the definition of a coelom is a body cavity, a second body cavity, other than the digestive cavity. It's a second body cavity within mesoderm. That's the definition of a coelom. And you need to know that definition because some animals are what we call coelomates and other animals are acelomates. They don't have a coelom. For example, platyhelminthes here is an acelomate. It does not have a coelom. Nematoda and rotifera are what we call pseudocelomates. They have another cavity, but it's not completely within mesoderm. And then mollusca and annelida and arthropoda and tardigrada, they are all true coelomates or eucelomates, meaning they have that completely formed cavity within that's completely within mesoderm. All right, and you're going to get more about that later. So if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. So here we see deuterostome development, and deuterostome means second mouth. So the anus forms first, and the mouth forms second. So that's one difference between protostome development and deuterostome development. And the other difference that I want you to note here is where the mesoderm forms in deuterostomes compared to protostomes. In protostome development, it forms here at the juncture between the ectoderm and the endoderm. In deuterostome development, it, it forms kind of like Mickey Mouse ears off of the archenteron, off of the endoderm. And then it continues to grow from there, and you end up with the same thing. You end up with a tube, a tube within a tube arrangement or body plan, along with a true coelom uh, that's completely within mesoderm. And this is the body plan that we see in echinoderms and chordates. In other words, phylum echinodermata and the phylum chordata, which includes us. So we have this form of embryonic development. In other words, when you were developing as an embryo, and, and when I was developing as an embryo, the first opening in, in our bodies was the anus. And then the archenteron uh, eventually continued infolding and, and fused with the ectoderm at the other end of the embryo and formed the mouth. So the mouth formed second. That's what deuterostome means, second mouth. All right, so notice that I labeled this the U coelom, the true coelom. Um, and so what is that all about? This whole coelom thing, what is that all about? Well, well that's what this next slide is, is trying to get across to you. What is the difference between an A coelomate, a pseudo coelomate, and a U coelomate? And what we're looking at is a cross section representing uh, uh, the bodies of three different groups, or actually four different groups, five different groups. Um, so the acelomate here is being represented by the phylum platyhelminthes, the flatworms. They have 
three tissue layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, but they're all right up against each other. And there is no cavity between them or within them. So notice there is no second cavity other than the digestive tract. All three of these diagrams have a digestive tract, but the acelomate doesn't have another cavity besides the digestive tract within the mesoderm. Whereas the pseudocelomate here, represented by the phylum nematoda and rotifera, has a second cavity other than the digestive tract, but it's between the mesoderm and the endoderm. It's not completely within mesoderm. It's not uh, completely lined by mesoderm. And, and we'll talk about the significance of that in a minute. But that represents a pseudocelomate, a false coelom, right? And then we have a eucelomate being represented by the phylum Annelida and phylum Mollusca. And you'll notice that the, the cavity, other than the digestive cavity, is completely lined by a mesoderm, right? So that's a eucelom, that's a true coelom, a cavity, a second body cavity that's completely within mesoderm, completely lined by mesoderm. And what that does, if you'll notice, is it lines the endoderm, it lines the alimentary canal with mesoderm. And mesoderm, as I'm trying to get across to you here, gives rise to muscle. These different germ layers, as they're known as, or tissue layers, give rise to other tissues. They become other specialized tissues through embryonic development. E ectoderm becomes skin, as you might imagine. You know, it's on the outside, so you would guess that it becomes skin. But it also gives rise to nervous tissue. So like the brain and all the other ner nervous tissue, the neurons that are throughout your body, they come from ectoderm. Mesoderm gives rise to muscle and uh, other organs, other than the, the digestive organs. Um, and so by surrounding the endoderm, surrounding the alimentary canal with mesoderm, that mesoderm becomes muscle. And that means that the alimentary canal is surrounded with muscle. And that muscle then is able to move food through the alimentary canal, move food through the digestive tract to help digest food. That's an evolutionary advantage. So these pseudocelomates, they actually have to move their whole body to move food through their digestive tract. And when we, well, when we study them, you'll see um, that they move like crazy. They're always flipping around. And part of the reason they're always flipping around is uh, probably to move the food through their digestive tract. So they have to move their whole body to move food through their digestive tract. It would be like you, you eat lunch and you'd have to sit in your chair squir uh, squ squirming around, moving your whole body to move the food through your digestive system. Pseudos or Eucelomates don't have to do that. There's a muscle system that completely lines the digestive system and moves through, through food through the digestive system by a, 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 a waves of contraction known as peristalsis. Peristalsis is, refers to the waves of contraction that move food through the, through the digestive system. All right, so that's a, that's a eucelomate. Um, and then endoderm becomes a digestive tract, as you might imagine, because that's what's lining the, the alimentary canal or the, or the digestive tract. So again, in a, in a eucelomate, we end up with a body plan that looks like this and, and looks like this. So these are one and the same. It's just that this is a cross section and this is what we call a longitudinal section through the body to show the different germ layers and the, and the two body cavities that result from embryonic development. Um, so this is, again, a tube within a tube arrangement. The, the whole body is a tube and then the alimentary canal or digestive tract is the tube that runs within the tube of the body. Then the last thing to note here is that Annelida and Mollusca are the first phyla to have a, a true coelom and be eucelomates and everything that follows is a eucelomate. All the higher phyla following Annelida and Mollusca are also eucelomates. Most notably, us. Finally, when it comes to the body plan, there's this concept known as symmetry. And you may know that your body is bilaterally symmetrical. Bilateral means two sides. Bi means two and lateral refers to sides. 
So your body is arranged in, in, in a bilateral arrangement where there's a mirror image on both sides, right? So if you draw a line right down the middle of your body, just like if we draw the, a line right down the middle of this crayfish, we end up with a mirror image on both sides. And most animals are bilaterally symmetrical. Bilateral symmetry begins with the phylum uh, platyhelminthes, with the flatworms, and it carries on throughout evolution from flatworms on, um, with the strange exception of adult echinoderms. Adult echinoderms have pentaradial symmetry, but that's the adults. The, larvas, the larvae still have bilateral symmetry. And along with bilateral symmetry come these positional terms that we use to uh, explain or try to describe or communicate position within an animal or on an animal. Um, and you may have heard of some of these, maybe not all of them, but we're talking about anterior versus posterior and dorsal versus ventral. So for example, the dorsal fin on a dolphin is called dorsal because it's on the back of the dolphin. So dorsal refers to the back or the top of the animal and ventral refers to the underside or the belly. Anterior refers to the front or in, uh, towards the head of the animal and posterior refers to in the rear or behind the animal. Um, and, and we also see the vocabulary term cephalized here and cephalized simply means having a head. So this crayfish obviously has a head, and, but not all animals have a head, right? Sponges don't have a head. Cnidarians don't have a head. Adult echinoderms don't have a head. So there are animals that don't have a head and cephalized or cephalization refers to um, the formation of the head. And again, platyhelminthes is the first to have a head and Basically, all other phyla, except for the weird exception of Echinodermata, adult Echinoderms, uh, also have a head. So I started with bilateral symmetry because that's what's most familiar to you because you are bilaterally symmetrical. Sponges have no symmetry at all. They have what's known as indeterminate growth. You have determinate growth. You, you're in a, your development, uh, there's a pattern to your body that is followed through development to give you a right arm and a left arm, you know, bilaterally symmetrical. In the case of sponges, there is no set pattern to what their body is going to become. Their growth is indeterminate. It doesn't follow any particular pattern and they can uh, form just about any shape, um, any shape there is. And because of that, they end up being what's referred to as asymmetrical. And that's periphera only. Periphera, phylum periphera, is the only phylum that is asymmetrical. And then when it comes to radial symmetry, uh, Cnidaria and Tenophora are radially symmetrical animals. So here we're looking at an anemone, and anemones are in the phylum Cnidaria and they are radially symmetrical, which means that they are arranged in a circle. And you can cut them just about any which way uh, and have a mirror image on both sides. So they have multiple planes across which they form a mirror image. And you can't use the terms anterior, posterior, dorsal, and ventral to refer to a radially symmetrical animal. So we use the term oral to refer to the uh, the end of the animal that has the mouth, and we use the term aboral to represent the opposite of the oral at the other end of the animal. Um, so oral versus aboral is how we refer to a radially symmetrical animal in terms of positional terms. And then echinoderms again are weird. They're pentaradial. They show pentaradial symmetry as adults. So it's radial symmetry based on the number five. Penta refers to five. All other phyla besides periphera and cnidaria and tenophora and echinodermata as adults are bilaterally symmetrical. And that, that's, that's, those are uh, the characteristics that, that describe the body plan. Body plans described in part by the form of development, either protostome or deuterostome, and by uh, the form of symmetry, either asymmetrical, radially symmetrical, pentaradially symmetrical, or bilaterally symmetrical.